theory is the claim that the oppressed can access a privileged standpoint on the social arrangement. As Sandra Harding says, this theory locates in a material and political disadvantage or form of oppression a distinctive insight about how a hierarchical social structure works. If the oppressed can access a privileged standpoint on the social arrangement, then we must turn to them in order to acquire knowledge of the social arrangement. Standpoint theory is therefore both theory and method. In fact, or so I shall argue, it is neither. I'll begin by challenging the intuition from which standpoint theory derives its plausibility, and I'll then show that even if standpoint theory is true, it doesn't provide a method. Uh, so as, as Terry Elliott recognizes, standpoint theory rests on a basic intuition. The oppressed have an experiential access to the reality of oppression that the oppressors do not. Elliott illustrates this intuition with three examples. Person A approaches a building and enters it unproblematically. As she approaches, she sees something perfectly familiar, which if asked, she might call the entrance. Person X approaches the same building and sees a great stack of stairs and the glaring lack of a ramp for his wheelchair. Person B arrives at the meeting of yet another literature class in a familiar building where he is accustomed to taking notes on the professor's interpretation of various well-known books of the corpus. Person Y finds herself in a room full of white people listening to one white person tell them what he thinks all these dead white people were trying to say when they wrote these books. Finally, person C attends, to an interesting, attends an interesting colloquium in the philosophy of religion in which he hears theorizing about the creative powers of that than which nothing greater can be thought. Person Z hears a whirring buzz of all too familiar words, he and him and his nature and his freedom and his power. But at least sometimes our concepts appear to preclude the experience of oppression. Consider, for instance, the concept woman. Woman is, or so Catherine McKinnon says, one who eroticizes subordination. According to this concept, a woman is realized as both sexual being and woman, rather than violated by subordination. It's therefore unclear how women can experience subordination as violating. Women may be subject to differential treatment, but it's unclear how they can experience this treatment as oppressive. Similarly, if our concept of disability is one according to which people with disabilities are deficiently human and therefore less entitled to occupy space, then person X may see a stack of stairs and a lack of ramp, but it's unclear how he can experience this as a wrong. Or if we associate intelligence with white manhood and so recognize as literature only what white men write, then it's unclear how person Y can see the focus on the work of dead white men as problematic. The intuition that the oppressed have experiential access to the reality of oppression emerges as relying on the possibility of conceptually unmediated experience. Standpoint theorists might defend themselves against this charge by claiming that the oppressed do not automatically occupy a standpoint, that they must struggle to achieve it. Kristen Interman suggests that they achieve it by forming a community, citing consciousness raising as an example. When individual women had certain experiences, such as being groped by their bosses, they interpreted them as anomalous, imagined, or deserved. However, when they came together in consciousness raising groups, they discovered that other women had these experiences and so their individual interpretations became inconsistent with the data. If many women have had the experience of being groped by their boss, then this experience is not anomalous. Uh, it's surely neither deserved, like can all women have invited this? And it's surely neither imagined, can all women have imagined this? But Interman evades the question. She assumes that individual women have experiences of violation, which they then dismiss by interpreting them as anomalous deserved or imagined. But the question is, if the concept woman is one who eroticizes subordination, then how do individual women have this experience of violation in the first place? How else then might we respond to the charge of reliance on the possibility of conceptually unmediated experience? We might say with William James that experience boils over. In other words, our experiences may exceed our concepts. Indeed, they're doing so is often what allows us to correct our concepts. But insofar as a conceptual scheme is prerequisite to experience, experience can boil over it only in ways that are continuous with it. For if experience boiled over a conceptual scheme in ways that were discontinuous with it, then it would occur despite it or independently of it. Uh, and so we'd be back at the problem of conceptually unmediated experience.
The experience of oppression, I want to suggest, may not be continuous with the consensual scheme. And I'm going to draw on Thomas Kuhn to show this. Uh, Kuhn argues that the reconstitution of kind terms results in discontinuity in consensual scheme. Kind terms possess two properties. First, they are coextensive with terms that can take the indefinite article. That a term is a kind term is thus part of what that term means. Second, their reference cannot overlap. For example, the referent of dog cannot also be the referent of cat. Since their reference cannot overlap, if we encounter a dog that is also a cat, we cannot simply add dog cat to the existing set of kind terms so that, so that we would have dog cat and dog cat. Nor can we revise the existing kind term dog to dog cat so that we would have dog cat and cat. Rather, we must reconstitute the kind terms dog and cat. We thereby redesign a part of the taxonomical structure of our conceptual scheme. By contrast, if we add a new kind term, we instead merely elaborate the structure. Or if we revise an existing kind term, we likewise preserve this structure. In redesigning a part of the taxonomical structure of the conceptual scheme, we produce a conceptual scheme that is discontinuous with the previous one. In the new conceptual scheme, a kind term dog cat exists, the referent of which encompasses the reference of dog and cat in the previous conceptual scheme. This means that in order to speak of the creatures that were in the previous conceptual scheme dogs, we must adopt a kind term dog that now shares a referent with the kind term in the new scheme dog cat. We must violate the second property of kind terms, the no overlap principle. Because we can't do this, we can't fully translate the old conceptual scheme into the new. The reconstitution of kind terms thus produces a conceptual scheme that is discontinuous with the previous one. At least sometimes the experience of oppression implies the reconstitution of kind terms. For instance, if woman is one who eroticizes subordination and man is one who eroticizes dominance, then a woman who experiences a man's subordination of her as violating has an experience that, given our concepts, only a man can have. As such, she is a woman man. But as the reference of kind terms can't overlap, we cannot add woman man to the existing set of kind terms so that we would have woman man and woman man. Nor can we revise woman to woman man so that we would have woman man and man. Rather, we must reconstitute the kind terms woman and man. A woman's experience of a man's subordination for his violating thus implies the reconstitution of kind terms. Similarly, if wife stands to husband as owner to owned, then a woman who experiences her husband's sexual treatment of her as improper, abusive, as rape, has an experience not merely that the concept wife precludes, but that the very distinction between the concepts wife and husband precludes. The distinction in which these two concepts exist. A woman's experience of marital rape thus implies the reconstitution of the distinction in which the kind terms wife and husband exist, and hence of these terms themselves. In these cases, the experience of oppression implies in the oppressed the presence of a certain property. This property does not merely contravene the definition of the kind term for the oppressed woman or wife. Rather, it contravenes the relationship of this kind term to the kind term for the oppressor, the relationship between woman and man or wife and husband which is the relationship in which both kind terms exist. If woman does not exist, then nor can man. If wife does not exist, then nor can husband. In contravening the relationship in which both kind terms exist, it reconstitutes these terms rather than simply altering them and thus redesigns a part of the taxonomical structure of the conceptual scheme. If redesign of the taxonomical structure of the conceptual scheme produces a scheme that is discontinuous with the previous one, and if the experience of oppression implies the reconstitution of kind terms, and with that the redesign of the taxonomical structure of the conceptual scheme, then the experience of oppression implies the production of a conceptual scheme that is discontinuous with the previous one. As such, this experience is not continuous with and so cannot have boiled over the previous conceptual scheme. In short, the experience of oppression is not of the boiling over sort. I therefore cannot see how the oppressed, or indeed anyone, can have experiential access to the reality of oppression. We will want to know then how the oppressed have come to experience oppression. 
We assume with Fricker that experience begets conceptual change, but in the case of conceptual change that produces discontinuity in conceptual scheme, the experience that would beget it cannot boil over in order to beget it. In this case, it's not experience that begets conceptual change, but conceptual change that begets experience. It's not a woman's experience of a man's subordination of her as violating that begets the reconstitution of the kind terms woman and man, but the reconstitution of these kind terms that begets this experience. The question of how the oppressed have come to experience oppression is thus the question of how a certain sort of conceptual change, the reconstitution of kind terms, happens. And this is a question for another day. Moreover, if the experience of oppression implies the reconstitution of kind terms, then it lacks the veridicality required to ground a standpoint. Recall that in reconstituting kind terms, we produce a conceptual scheme into which we cannot fully translate the old one. The new and old schemes are thus incommensurable. If the new and old schemes are incommensurable, then the experience of which the new admits, namely the experience of oppression, cannot be said to be more veridical than the experience of which the old admitted, namely the experience of, of justice. It therefore cannot be said to ground an epistemically privileged vantage point. This changes our understanding of the relationship in which two groups of people, those who perceive injustice and those who don't, stand to reality and to one another. We have thought that those who perceive injustice are those who have succeeded in apprehending reality, or those who do not are those who remain enthralled to ideology. On my view, those who perceive injustice are those who have subscribed to a new conceptual scheme, while those who do not are those who continue to subscribe to the old. The two groups are not the enlightened and the ignorant, but two semantic communities. One may have to struggle for a standpoint, as standpoint theorists say, but this struggle is semantic, not epistemic. <clears throat> I'll admit that I'm not sure whether the experience of oppression necessarily requires the reconstitution of kind terms, nor am I sure when exactly the reconstitution of kind terms results in discontinuity in conceptual scheme, must it result in sufficiently widespread change in the taxonomical structure, and if it must, what counts as sufficiently widespread? In response to this question, Kuhn says, could Newtonian mechanics withstand revision of the second law, of the third law, of Hooke's law? Or the law of gravity? These are not questions that individually have yes or no answers. Rather, like Wittgenstein's, could one play chess without the queen? They suggest the strains placed in a lexicon by questions that its designer, whether God or cognitive evolution, did not anticipate its being required to answer. I therefore don't mean to show once and for all that the experience of oppression can never boil over and all that that implies. Rather, I mean to cast doubt on the assumption that it can and all that that implies. So that is standpoint theory as theory. I now want to talk about standpoint or to critique standpoint theory as method. Standpoint theorists claim that this theory provides a method. They do not, however, say precisely what this method is. Instead, they speak opaquely of studying up, starting thought from marginalized lives and approaching inquiry from the perspective of insiders. This suggests that standpoint theory provides a weak method. We must begin inquiry by listening to the oppressed. I will argue that it does not for the following reasons. First, this method is qua method problematic. If the oppressed have epistemic privilege with respect to the social arrangement, then we must listen to the oppressed in order to know who is oppressed and how. To know who is oppressed is to know who has epistemic privilege, which is to know who we must listen to. And to know how they are oppressed is to know the domain over which their epistemic privilege holds, which is to know what we must listen to them about. We therefore cannot know prior to listening who we must listen to and what we must listen to them about. We can know this only if we already have a theory of oppression. Such a theory informs us of who is oppressed and what the site of their oppression is, and thus of who has epistemic privilege and over what domain. For instance, a Marxist theory informs us that the working class is exploited and that the site of their exploitation is work, and thus that the working class has epistemic privilege and that it has this privilege over the domain of work. Similarly, a radical feminist theory informs us that women are subordinated and that the site of subordination is sexuality, and thus that women have epistemic privilege and that they have this privilege over the domain of sexuality. 
The weak method is therefore parasitic on a theory of oppression. Insofar as it is parasitic on a theory of oppression, it presupposes an understanding of the social arrangement. And if it presupposes such an understanding, then we must have acquired this understanding otherwise than by adhering to this method. We must, that is, have acquired an understanding of the social arrangement otherwise than by listening to the oppressed. This appears to undermine the claim that the oppressed have epistemic privilege with respect to the social arrangement. In short, if the weak method presupposes a theory of oppression, then it undermines the claim that the oppressed have epistemic privilege with respect to the social arrangement. But if it does not, then it's not, fru it's not fruitful, it's not useful as a method. Second, this method trivializes standpoint theory. Uh, on this picture, we listen to the oppressed simply in order to generate questions, which we can then settle via empirical inquiry. The oppressed are privileged only in the context of discovery. They're not privileged in the context of justification. And I think this is what the claim of epistemic privilege requires, um, that, they, that they have privilege in the context of justification. Third, this method misunderstands the oppressed testimony and may be unable to verify it. The oppressed sometimes ask, I think, not, not merely that we listen to their testimony, but that we believe it. And they do, it seems to me, because empirical inquiry cannot verify it. So consider the slogan, believe women. To adhere to the weak, to the weak method in this case is to listen to women's sexual assault testimony and to then empirically inquire into it in order to establish its truth. But it strikes me that believe women is an injunction to something more. Insofar as we hold a concept of woman as one who eroticizes subordination, one who desires to be overcome, we can see a woman's resistance only as her invitation to be overcome. We cannot see it as genuine. So until we reconstitute this kind term, empirical inquiry cannot verify women's sexual assault testimony. Women then can only ask that we believe them, which is ultimately to ask that we believe that they, that women, do not eroticize their subordination. It is to ask that we reconstitute the kind term woman. In sum, standpoint theory does not provide the weak method. This method is fruitless or it is fruitful but undermines standpoint theory and it trivializes this theory. So perhaps it provides instead a strong method. We must defer to the oppressed. But this method is circular. If the oppressed have epistemic privilege with respect to the social arrangement, then we must defer to the oppressed in order to know who is oppressed. We must defer to those to whom we must defer in order to know to those to whom we must defer. We cannot non circularly determine to whom we must defer. Standpoint theory therefore provides neither a weak nor a strong method. To conclude, Recall that the reconstitution of kind terms implies the redesign of a part of the taxonomical structure of our conceptual scheme. If our conceptual scheme shapes our experience, thus creating empirical evidence, then radically altering our conceptual scheme, such redesign may result in hitherto inconceivable experience and hence hitherto inconceivable empirical evidence. This means that not until we reconstitute a kind term can we produce the empirical evidence that would verify it. As Kuhn says, ordinarily it is only much later, after the new paradigm has been developed, accepted and exploited, that apparently decisive arguments are developed. Producing them is part of normal science and their role is not in paradigm debate, but in post-revolutionary texts. Acceptance of this reconstitution is therefore necessarily an act of faith. So insofar as moral progress requires the reconstitution of kind terms, as I think it does in the case of women, it requires an act of faith. In this sense, it does require deference to the oppressed. But as we're not obligated to take leaps of faith, nor are we uh, obligated to defer. Thanks for listening.